morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sean, or you can call me uh, Sione if you are from the island. You can call me that. Um, but I usually do send out the lessons via email, just so everyone can follow along a little bit easier. As well, you can go build your own convictions after you go home. You can research it yourself. But um, you know, just starting it off today, I was thinking about I was writing this lesson. I really love coming to this church because most places you will go to. And you are brought together because of your commonalities, right? People are brought together because things that they have in common. But we're brought here today because of our differences. Amen. And I think about that. Even the, the two main differences, I believe, why we're brought together when we come to church is our first differences is the one that should be celebrated. And it is our differences of our culture, our strengths, and our weaknesses. Most churches, sometimes they try to, to gather together the things that they have common. Okay, there's only going to be a Samoan church here, or only Chinese church here. But that, that, that doesn't actually help us grow. It's also being part of this church, every single person almost comes from a different culture or a different upbringing. So that's the first one that should be, you know, to be celebrated, that we're here to build each other up. The second difference that we come here for church is to be transformed though. It is the differences that we have between us and the Bible. Right? We come up and we live and we, we see our lives and the standards of the Bible. And we say, wow, this is a bit different. We're not actually holding to it. So we come here as a church to say, hey, let, let's, let's transform this difference. Let's now make it common where our lives are the same thing as the Bible. Some churches, instead, they'll change the Bible to match our lives. In this church, we're going to change our lives to match the Bible. That's really awesome to come together to see these differences and to want to make a difference. Yo, know, there are a lot of differences out there in the world, and they can affect people differently. I think even, even in the science community, you know, I, I love science, and the thing that's very interesting is when you don't look at what the sciences agree on, but you actually look at what they disagree on. And that's when you start to get really interested in what science is talking about. One of the biggest things that they disagree on is, what is life? What is that? How do you define something living or just existing or being matter? You know, it's a simple question that should have a simple answer, but even the science community does not know. There are over a hundred different definitions in the science community, and all of them are a little bit contradictory. We know that we've been brought up, if you have kind of learned biology and things in school, uh, you come with this supposedly basic definition of life. And it has at least these different components. It says that it has to have movement, something's living. It has to have respiration, meaning it can breathe or kind of have something in and out of its body. Uh, sensitivity it has to have growth, reproduction, exertion, meaning having energy, and it has to have nutrition. Okay, but when we're talking about what is life, that's not really what we meant usually when we ask that to somebody else, right? It's not about what exists. We're talking about what is that life like? You know what I mean? Have you ever had to use that word twice? He's just like, I'm not hungry, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm not hungry, hungry, but I'm hungry. Yeah. You know, I, I love the English language that that makes sense to us. I never really heard that said in other languages. Uh, es no caliente, pero caliente, caliente. You know? oh. <laughs> it doesn't usually work, but but here we're talking about life, life. Like what makes someone living? Not just the definition of existing. But to live and to exist are, are two different things. Um, there are many famous quotes about, about life and how we can kind of be inspired by it. Some say that life is to be happy and that's all that matters. Abraham Lincoln, I believe, said this. In the end, it's not the years in your life that counts, but the life in your years. Though it doesn't make sense in a scientific manner, we know what they're talking about. You know, no matter what quote inspires you, we can all at least agree on one thing that we have in common, is that is we have one life. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had that like one last chip in the bag? Mm -hmm. You're willing to share everything else except that last yep. one. Right? There's something about having one last one that's important. Yeah, I'll share with you all my other fries, but if I get to the last one, there's a, there's a, there's a universal rule. You can't take the last one or something. Yeah. <laughs> but even when you think that, like, okay, you have one life and one last one. Who are you giving it to? What are you giving it to? That's what we're going to talk about today. In Colossians 3, verse 1 through 4, it talks about here, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, sit at the right hand of God. 
Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, you, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear in his glory. Yo, they say, hey, music is life. Food is life. Sleep is life. Love is life. Well, I want you to adopt a new one. It says here in this scripture that Christ is your life. My title of my lesson today is simply that. Christ is your life. And we're going to be talking about what does that actually mean yeah. to live a life for Christ. So point number one is simply going to be raised to a new life. Usually we've been doing these lessons over the past couple of months um, of different lessons that we do with people that want to come on into the church and understand what we believe in. This is actually one lesson we do with somebody after they have decided that they want to become a Christian, after they been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and now they're starting to live this new life. And so this is just the context of these lessons. So again, point number one, raised to a new life. If you are turning in your Bible, you can please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So it says here in verse 16 and 17, it says, from now on, we, um, excuse me, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. You know, even when you think about it, other than just a life, when you have when you have something that's old and worn out for so long, and you get something new, you just want to show it off. I know people have probably even noticed how I got like this new leather jacket. I've never had a leather jacket in my life. But it's like, I, I know I'm telling Tegan, I have a strategy if you haven't noticed. So I love wearing it every day, but I know that you guys notice I love wearing it, so I try to go without it for like two days, you know, and I wear my other jackets and everything and try to throw you off my set, but uh, I don't think it's really working, you know. When someone has something new, they're excited about it. You know, they have their new shoes and they're just kind of walking around, but like, they're, they're excited about it. And it says here that, that wow, when, when you have a new life, that's what this scripture is talking about, that you have a new life, it's exciting. That the old is gone, it's not just put off to the side, or, or hidden, or put away, but it's, it's, it's gone. It's vanished. You cannot bring it back if you wanted to. See, some people get excited about that. You hear it. Man, it's a new day. Wow, it's a, it's a whole new week. Actually, it's so good, it's a new week. People get excited when there's a new year. Wow, this year is going to be different. I'm setting up goals, resolutions. This scripture is saying you have a straight up new life. Wow. Not a new day, not a new moment. You have a whole new life. And it's not just one thing, but it, it continues to happen as you walk in the light. We know in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you will have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ his Son purifies us from all sin. It's kind of like you're having this fresh shower like every day for our souls. You know, I know even when we played volleyball yesterday, kind of as a church, you get all sweaty and everything, but there's something good just going back and just washing all that away. That's, that's what it's saying here. It's like, you have a new life and continue me to do so. And it says here that this only happens when you actually go with Christ, when you start living with Him, that that's when you can have a new life. Now, some people might even argue, well, no, that's not true. I don't believe that. I don't have to have God to have a new life. And um, to be honest, I wish that was true. But it's not. But you, you think you can do something different. You think you can go and do whatever you want. But your masters won't let you. What I mean by that is you say, hey, I, I want to change and have a happy life and do things different. But the things that roll over you, they're going to make you stuck. Mm. You know, you'll say you want to do something different, but your parents aren't going to understand. So then you give in to them. You want to change your life, but your master is named university says you have to go to work and you have to study or else, okay, now I can't change the things that I really wanted to. See, people outside that allow other things to master them, they couldn't walk away if they wanted to. If you're mastered by your career or by your peers or about anything else in your life other than Christ, you're not free. You think you can tell yourself that you can walk away from things, but you can't. It only happens when you walk with Christ. See, it is a freeing thing to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You can walk away from anything. It's not about that I'm not committed or I don't have commitment. 
it's that I'm already connected to my purpose. There's nothing else that, that, that holds my purpose. Whether it's a job or, or some responsibility, if those things are weighing down my life and causing me not to have a happy life, what's the point of holding on to it? I only have one. It's like my last chip. I'm not going to give it to the seagulls. Right? It, it's special. It's my last life. Why, why give it to something that's a waste of my time? That's what it means to live a life and race to a new life with Christ. See, most people don't have the strength to walk away because you don't have the hope to keep on going. But Christ can do that for you. It says here that we live a new life that we're connected to God. But that's not only externally in what we do, but also internally. If you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18, it says, Therefore we do not lose hope, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Saying not only are we living a new life on what we're doing and what we're connected to and what we're dedicated to, but even in our hearts, we're living this refreshing life each day. See, so many people, again, if it's not some job or some career that's rolling them, it's their emotions or their words. It's that, it's that they can't just change their heart. And it's saying here that since after we become a Christian, that we've been given the Holy Spirit to overcome these things, that we now have the power. See, people are noticeably dragging their feet through potential beautiful moments because of something that happened some yesterdays ago. Saying so even though that our body is getting weighed away, we are getting renewed each day. See, all these troubles and dramas that weigh down others are nothing to us because it's, not, it, it's that we have something more to care about. It's saying here that our eyes are not just fixed on this world anymore, that we're now our eyes are fixed on God. And all the other worries and everything else that, that the world tries to weigh us down, it doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like we, we found the beauty to see in someone. It's like, you know, I, I, I'm married to my awesome, beautiful, and awesome wife here, Tegan. Um, if she randomly walked out the door and walked back in with, like, some stuff on her shirt, her hair all messed up, her lipstick just kind of, she sneezed, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but um, I, 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 she wouldn't look any less beautiful. Aww. Right? Because I, I, see, I see the beauty in her. I know who she is. I, I, know, what's, I know what's awesome about her. People are caught up in all the, 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 the clothing of the world. See, we found in this life, we're like, we found the deep beauty of this life. That we have a purpose and we have a God who loves us. And that's the only thing we care about. Anything else is just messed up the hair. It doesn't really matter. We see the beauty of this life. Yeah. We understand why we're here. See, my first challenge and my first point is, what are you living for? What are your eyes focused on? Have you actually decided to now live a new life in Christ? Or are you still living for other different purposes? Well, point number two, put to death. See, if we're talking about we have to live a new life, then we're going to have to leave the old one behind, right? Yeah. We can't have both lives kind of dragging along. So here in Corinthians verse uh, chapter 3, verse 5 through 11, it talks about what we're going to need to put to death in our lives to live a new life. It says here in verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of the things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile nor Jew, um, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ in all and is in all. It talks about here of what we need to put to death. It says that we need to kill our old ways to death, murder it till it's dead. Our old life needs to be lifeless and dead. Why do I say that 10 different ways? Because some people still have no idea 
what it means to put something to death. They still have sin walking around in their lives, and they're confused when they're asked about it. Like, hey, you, you put that to your life, right? Yeah, man, that thing's dead. It's gone. It's buried. Well, I just saw a homie walking down the street right now. What are you talking about? Like, you said he was dead, right? Right? Like, think about that. What, why are these things still alive? Why are these things still walking around in our life? It's like, how freaked out would you be if your sin was kind of like representing the, your, your dead pets uh, that, that have been throughout your life? Meaning, if you had your dead dog and everything and they start walking around again, you'd be freaked out. But well, I, I, thought, I thought little Poochie was dead. What is he doing around here? Right? You'd be going crazy. But that's like our sin and we take it like it's totally normal. Like, yeah, I put this to death, but uh, I came back in my life. Yeah, I just couldn't, I just, it, it just come back. You know, it's, it's like, what, what are we doing? We, we don't really understand what it means to put something to death. It's like we have like these zombie sins in our life. They, all get, they, they die, but they come back. And we all know, we've all seen the movies, right? We're all, we've all been shouting at the, the TV screen, how do you kill a zombie? Shoot them in the head, right? <laughs> what does that mean? You know, we, we, we've seen all the movies where they wasted half the movie trying to find a cure and everything else. All you got to do is you cut off the head. Now, what does that mean for sin? It means you find the root. You go and find the root and dig deep in your life. Why is a sin still in my life? Wow. You find the root and cut it out. You know, you might even say, well, hey, the root of the sin is I'm the root. Okay, that makes sense. That's why you have to die to yourself. That's why the whole life needs to die. Yes, we are the root. There, yes, we can blame our circumstances or how our parents raised us or our society, but there's no one else to blame for us, than us. Why? Because we feel the consequences. Yeah, we can point our fingers at anybody else, but we're the ones that are living with that sin in our lives. We have to be the ones that look down, find our root, and be the See, we must put our sin, we must, uh, excuse me, put our sin to death and not just put it away for a while. Yeah. There is a big difference between putting sin to death and repenting than going between periods of sin. And I'm not just trying to build this con conviction not that long ago. See, some people might go like this, like, okay, hey, I got drunk on last Friday. I didn't get drunk uh, until like a month later. Did they repent for a month? No, they're just in between sin. They actually haven't changed their character or changed their convictions. They're just in between sin. To die to your sin and repent does not just mean being between. It means you totally die to it. You're done with it. Okay, amen, we're not perfect. But there should be a refreshing and a changing that's happening between your sin. If you are just going between periods of sin, oh, hey, I sinned last week. I've been doing okay, but I probably going to fall into it next week. You're not dying to it. It's still alive in your life. And the thing is that we have to take this seriously. Because if we don't put our sin to death, it's going to lead to ours. In James 5, verse, excuse me, James 1, verse 15, it says, Then after, um, then, uh, excuse me, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. See, desire just meaning our temptation. Yeah. And it's saying that here, instead of doing what the world tells you to do, meaning, hey, if it's on your heart, follow it. Or if it's the way you are, just follow it. No, it's saying, if there's that desire, don't, don't meet it halfway. You run away from it. Because there's this growth that happens. There's desire that leads to sin. Then, uh, excuse me, um, once conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin fully grows to death. Many of you, have, have you ever seen a dead person? No, I'm not talking about the ones like in a morgue. I mean like those that are still walking around. But I'm talking about those that, you know, are walking around and, and yeah, they, they might not have been dead, but they're actually even worse than zombies. Because zombies, you've seen the movie, at least they have a drive and a motive, you know? They talk about what they want to do, brains, right? They, 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 <laughs> in some movies, at least. They have what they want, but I'm talking about these people that just, like, are dead inside. They, they don't know what they want. You know, we talked about the basic definition of life earlier, and I think they're losing some of these. 
You know, their heart has lost all sensitivity. Their character has lost all hope of growth. Their soul has not received nutrition for a very long time. Actually, according to the science community, if we're applying that to spirituality, they're not alive. They, they don't meet the requirements. So what it means to put to death our sin is either we're going to put it to death or it's going to put us to death. We're not going to be able to live that new life that's freeing and awesome and, and feels great if, if, if we still have sin in our lives. Mm -hmm. See, my challenge is simply understanding this. You can't live a new life of Christ when you haven't died to your old one yet. Yeah. Guys, it's, it's time to face the end. It's time to face those hard questions and those hard roots that are in our lives. And say, why am I still doing this? Why do I still act this way? Stop waiting for something else to happen. I want to challenge you guys. If there's still things that you haven't yet died to, get with the person that may have brought you around or people in the church. And get open about it. Say, hey, this is something that's still in my life and I really want to kill it. Can you help me? Get open with those that brought you along. And this is what's awesome, again, being part of this church is that these differences that we can celebrate, that there might be somebody in this church that has a strength that where you hold a weakness. Get open and say, hey, how can I die to this in my life? Okay, so we're living that new life. We've died to our old sins. Now, point number three, clothe yourself with Christ. Colossians 3, verse 12 through 14. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself, or clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Says, okay, to live for Christ is to live like Christ, right? He's saying not only do we just kind of, oh, hey, we have a little uh, guest speaker. Um, but not, not only do we have just, okay, we have to live with Christ, but we have to live like Christ. So many churches will try and make Christian life so boring and extremely vague. I know when I was growing up in a church and uh, they talked to me about converting and giving my life to Christ, it was awesome and excited and I was excited to go to the retreats and all these things. But after they, they uh, I said the prayers and I went up to the altar, I did all those things, um, it was more of like, okay, awesome, now just go feel good about yourself. There wasn't like this call to change my character or actually repent in my life. They kind of said, pat on the back, that's awesome, you're good, we'll see you next Sunday. Nothing See, actually, this scripture is telling us that so much more, we're, we're, we're supposed to change. We're supposed to do something to, differently. We're supposed to change our character. It says here instead, my Bible now calls us that we're supposed to change how we treat each other. And our, our character must go through change. You know, I remember that even when someone appointed uh, years ago, actually, how uh, three years ago, yeah, um, I, when I got appointed an evangelist, which is pretty much a, a I don't know, a, a, a different word for church leader, I guess, for those who don't know what that word means. Um, I didn't know what that word meant. But um, I got appointed an evangelist, which is me, mainly giving me the opportunity to lead churches. And I remember so many people were excited for me. They came up and they're like, man, Sean, do you, do you feel any different? Like, how do you feel? <laughs> feel any different, man? Like, it doesn't mean anything. All they did was give me a little bit of a speech and, you know, I got to do all the things. But I started to feel different when the responsibilities came. <laughs> yeah, now I started to feel different. You know, excited. How does it feel? Pressure. You know? <laughs> How does it feel? I don't know what I'm doing. You know? And, okay, now I started to feel different. Why? Because not only the title didn't mean anything. Yeah. It was the responsibilities and the changes that I was calling to, to, to be like. In the same way, when someone calls you, oh, you made a decision to become a Christian, that's awesome. But it doesn't really feel any different. Okay, but now the responsibilities come. You gotta start living like Christ now. Yeah. Okay, now you better start changing. Now things better start to feel different. So he says, hey, okay, well, you gotta go and put all these things on. We won't go specifically on what it talks about, but you see here, it's, it's, it's a character change. It's a heart and love change. You gotta put on compassion. Kindness, humility, having other people above yourself, gentleness, patience, and forgiveness. Putting on all these things and how we're treating each other differently. 
And when it says to put these things on, it's saying it's a one-time thing. Mm. That you don't put it on like it's our, 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 our physical clothing and take it off later. It's a one-time thing and you never take it off. See, most of our issues in our relationships is because we are constantly changing our character depending on who we are with or how we feel. He's saying, put these on and never take it off. I remember someone preached that not that long ago and it changed my view on how I'm supposed to act as a Christian. See, Paul goes on and talks about throughout this chapter how not only are we clothing ourselves, but Christ clothes us as well. In Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all baptized um, children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized in Christ have, uh, have clothed yourself with Christ. It's saying that how God views you after you've been made into a disciple, repented of your sins, been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, is that you are now clothed in Christ. Meaning that... In yourself, you can kind of see, okay, I'm a sinner. God sees me as all these bad things and everything. But now, after you've been baptized, God sees you as Jesus. As perfection. Because all your sins have been washed away. And he sees Christ. But think about it. Like, what if Christ or God treated this clothing as you treat the clothing of compassion? Or kindness or patience or forgiveness? That sometimes you take it on and sometimes you leave it at home. What if Christ did that to you after your baptism? Oh, some days I'll look at you as Christ, but other days I'm just going to take off the Christ clothing and I see you as your sinner. Mm -hmm. Just because I, I just don't feel like forgiving you today. I, I'll change your clothing every now and then. Depending on how I feel. Wow. God doesn't do this that way. God doesn't treat this clothing as this way. When he says he's clothing you with Christ, it was a one-time thing. It was awesome. You are now clothed with Christ. In the same way, we need to treat it the same way. We need to look at these qualities and say, okay, which one am I taking off to for you? Which one of these things have not just been adopted onto who I am, but it's just something where, okay, I put it on for show when I come to church, or when I, when I see religious people, or when I see my friends, I put the smile on, but in my heart, I, I really don't forgive them. See, it says here that when we continue to live this new life, it's not just a new life and saying the words, God, you're my Lord, but it's a change in character. And that's when people will really be able to tell, are you changing? And is God your Lord? So point number four, just kind of wrapping up to a close. We're going to see here, not are we only changing our, 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 our character and how we're treating other people, but we're also changing our attitudes as well. In Colossians 3, verse 15 through 24. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are all called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs in the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it, um, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your husbands. That is, it is fitting to the Lord. Husband, love your wives, and do not, uh, do not be harsh to them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly math, masters in everything, and do it. Not only when their eyes is on you, and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. It is the Lord Christ who you are serving. So pretty much we're going to focus on the beginning part and see how that trickles on down to all these different relationships. The wives, the husbands, the mothers, the fathers, all those different things. It first starts off and says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let it. I thought that was, a, that was an interesting choice of words. Meaning, allow it. Stop fighting it. Let it actually rule in your heart. See, there are many things that are trying to be the ruler of your life. We know your parents, your all these other different things, but mainly one of my biggest contenders, at least, and I don't know if you can relate, is myself. I want to be the ruler of my life. But it's saying here that we will not have peace 
if we're going to be fighting God all along the way. If we have not yet to surrender to God, whatever it takes for him to live, um, for us to live his life. So what is a piece of Christ? What does it talk about that? Um, see, for most people, they experience peace when their circumstances allow it. Whenever something is how they want it or things are going exactly how they plan. The peace of Christ is way beyond that. It is when you are facing the cross with determination because you know it's God's will. See, the peace of Christ, when he was facing the cross, he still had this peace on his own. He's like, I'm doing it for God, and I know everything's going to work out as he's planned. And this type of peace, when you have this type of peace, even the cross won't harm you. Even the cross in your life won't, won't worry you. When you're facing death, you still have peace in your life. You know, have you ever seen someone who's just stressed out for nothing? That's kind of like people who are fighting the peace of, uh, 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 the peace of Christ. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been as malicious as me, but I used to have like little uh, uh, nieces and nephews, and I've always played this game, making them cry, where you pretend like you're taking their nose, and then they start crying, give me my nose back, you know? For us, we look at that like, what are you crying about? Your nose has never left, like, it, everything's okay, but it's, it's still a lot of fun, that's what uncles are supposed to do. But, um, you know, it's kind of like the same thing, when people are worrying in their life, where God, in God's point of view, it's like, you have everything you need. This is awesome. You're like, where is it? Uh, like what? You're, you're, you're crying and whining about something that, that, that's perfectly fine. Come on, Sean. That's the same way how God is viewing us. Like, why don't you just let the peace of Christ be in your life? He's saying more than that, okay, have this peace of Christ and be thankful. Give thanks for everything you do without question or without complaint. See, once you start the beginning of this and start letting it grow in your life, being surrendered to God, God with this peace, and being thankful for everything, all the other relationships just work each other out. Mm -hmm. The wife that doesn't want to submit, the husband that doesn't want to give time to his wife, the parents that don't really see the needs of their kids, even the slave that feels like they have just some injustice in their life. They're like, you know what? God knows what he's doing. Yeah. See, even when you can say, you can't say this. You can't say, I'll submit to God, but I won't submit to people. That's kind of like Jesus facing the cross and saying, I'll submit to God, but I won't submit to the Romans that want to arrest me. It came hand in hand. They're both together. God was, excuse me, Jesus was submitting to Christ and saw the Romans part of God's plan. It's the same way. We have people in our lives that we're not willing to, to give our heart to and say, oh, I'll do it to God, but not to people. You, you don't really understand that this is going hand in hand. That when we're living this new life, we, we, we see people in our relationships differently as well. See, my last challenge is just living a new life for Christ allows us to live a new life with others. What relationships have you allowed to stay in that same mess now that even though you have the power to change it? What relationships are you just scared of facing them? Actually, I want this relationship to be different, but there's some pains that I'm going to have to face. I want to encourage you not just to face those relationships and to go after and have those difficult conversations, but to go back and is the peace of, of Christ in your hearts? Are you thankful for these relationships? When the last time have you prayed through these difficult relationships? See, in conclusion, kind of wrapping it all together, what is life? The very first question that we start with. Though there may be a, a lot of different definitions, a hundred different definitions out in the science community, I think the only answer, answer that is worth our only last life that we have is Christ is life. Meaning that we need to die to our old sin, and when we do so, we can see him change your world. Mm -hmm. I just really want to encourage you guys that if you've come here still living that old life, if you've come here still wanting to live that new life, get with the person that invites you along. Study the Bible and understand what it means to start living this new life with Christ. Yeah. And thank you guys very much.